Well, welcome back to Revelation chapter 18. I know we've taken a break for a couple of weeks, but we are back in the saddle and ready to go. Today, we're going to begin with uh, Revelation 18, which is a continuation of Revelation 17, and it's giving us the characteristics, the details of really the final collapse of the world's financial system, the world's religious system, and truly the world's political system. And then Revelation chapter 19, God's going to uh, put an exclamation point uh, at the return or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is truly called the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we talk about the first coming of Christ uh, when he came to earth through the womb of the Virgin Mary, that is known as the incarnation. And then we know that he uh, died on the cross, he resurrected from the dead. The Bible said in Acts chapter 1, he ascended back to heaven. And we know that Jesus is going to come back the same way he ascended up. We also know there is an interlude when we believe as a futurist that Jesus will come back in the heavens. He will come back, uh, not all the way to earth, but he will come back and draw up, call up the people of God who are currently serving and are faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in the generation in which he returns, which is called the rapture. But after the rapture, we know there will be a period of seven years of tribulation. And during the seven years of tribulation, all hell will break loose on earth. The Antichrist will rule. Uh, his false prophet will preach propaganda, uh, deceptions, and, and there will be counterfeit everything, all right? A counterfeit trinity, a counterfeit church, a counterfeit government. It's all going to be false, deceptive, and counterfeit. And we have to know that. But that's going to be happening during the tribulation period. And then God will settle all the scores during the tribulation. And that brings us to today. In Revelation chapter number 18, God is settling the score with the, not, not, the religious uh, system has collapsed now, known as the great harlot. It has collapsed in Revelation 17. And today God is showing us in Revelation 18 that he is going to bring judgment against the economic and the, the worldly financial system, okay? That is... Uh, cause the world to be drunk, basically, or intoxicated uh, on the power of wealth. And so we see that in Revelation chapter 18. But what I want to do is give you one word of encouragement. Now, I'm going to start with Revelation 17, 17. And if you'll take a look at your, uh, your Bible or take a look at these notes, I want you to see something. The Bible said in Revelation 17, 17, for God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. What I want you to know is that even though during the tribulation period it does appear that hell has broken loose on earth, and in essence it has, but God is bringing a judgment against hell on earth. God is bringing a judgment against Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and all the counterfeit systems of this world. And God is doing it. But I want you to know that, that, that even though it looks as chaotic as can be, that God is in control. And this is the very purpose of God. God is sovereign. God is aware of every detail of every situation in this entire world and God is fulfilling his purpose and God is fulfilling prophecies. Today we'll see the fulfillment of prophecies from Jeremiah and Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. We see them fulfilling regularly in this book of Revelation because God will keep his word. All words of man shall fail, but not one word of God will ever fail. God spoke the truth, and the truth will come to pass. And that's what we have in Revelation 17, 17. It is clear that evil will eventually turn on evil, but God will use that for his purposes to carry out his eternal plan for this earth, okay? So we'll, we'll, put it, we'll start there. Uh, and one other thing, we talked about we talked a lot about Babylon. 
We know that Babylon is a geographical place. It is basically, uh, Babylon is south of Baghdad. And there was a guy, many of you would know him, his name was Saddam Hussein. He thought that himself of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, and the one, the great king of the empire of Babylon. And so he resurrects this, uh, this particular city, and we believe that it is a true geographical location. You can trace the roots back to Babylon all the way to Genesis create a society without God through the Tower of Babel. So this is interesting to me. History has a, a, a huge beginning in Babylon, all right? So much information about ba Babylon in the beginning. And so where God starts it over there, God's going to end it over there. And I do believe that there will be a physical, geographical Babylon involved in the process in the end times. I'm, I'm just positive of that based on a preponderance of Scripture. But regardless, Babylon is far more than just one geographical location. Babylon is a system. Babylon is a philosophy. Babylon is, is a reality. And there are many marks to what Babylon represents. So I could say the United States of America has all the marks of Babylon. I can certainly say there are much, there's much going on in the Middle East that has all the marks of Babylon. And so we will just take a moment. Let me just take you a moment. You might want to take a pencil and paper out and write these down. I give you seven marks of Babylon, okay? I read this in a book, and I thought they really summed it up well. I don't even remember the name of the book that I was reading, but I just wrote the notes down by hand, and I'm going to bring them to you today, okay? So the marks of Babylon, number one is Babylon is a godless society. If you go back to the Tower of Babel, all right, in the beginning, check this out. Babel was basically the term for Babylon, but God, it's where God came and confused the languages, if you remember that. Well, Babylon uh, was that tower, or Babel was the tower that man and society came together and said, let's build this tower all the way to heaven and just prove to all mankind that we can do our life without God. And in essence, we live in a society that is hell-bent on living their lives without God. Sorry for the language, but it's the truth. They are bent, I mean determined, to live their lives without God. And we know that godless society is everywhere in the world today. And there are marks of God and His people, and there, there are remnants of God and His people in this world, and there always will be. But the preponderance today in our world is a preponderance of a godless society. Number two, whenever you see a godless society, you know there's going to be immorality through sensuality. And Babylon or Babyloness is always filled with immorality, which is sin against God through sensuality. You know, I was reading something about worldliness, and certainly immorality through sensuality is a form of worldliness. Well, worldliness is a philosophy that is determined to make our society believe that immorality is right and godliness is wrong. They're bent on it. And so they flip the biblical script, and now they are indoctrinating our children, indoctrinating society. They are doing everything they can to indoctrinate you and I uh, in ways that are against the will of God. Be aware. We live in an ungodly society filled with immorality based on the sensuality of the human heart that's away from God. Number three, there will always be injustice of enslavement. Now, we'll read in Revelation 18 of how even in Babylon they trafficked in the souls of men. I want you to know behind slavery is Satan, period. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, as well as enslave you, all right? But Jesus came to set you free.
And whenever there's enslavement, it's always based on the injustice of the enemy of our soul, and that is the devil himself, okay? Number four, there will always be in Babylon a worship of the material or materialism, and you have to be aware of that because man's heart is going to worship something, and if he doesn't worship God, then he will fall in love with something, and, and so oftentimes it's either himself or his own pursuits of pleasure and happiness in this life. Number five, there's always going to be violence associated with Babylon. Babylon was violent against God in the beginning. It was violent during the days of Nebuchadnezzar, and it will be violent in the end time. So violence is normal in a Babylon-like culture, a Babylon-like country, all right? Number six is there will always be deception through counterfeit. As I have taught you throughout the book of Revelation, Satan is the master deceiver. He is a counterfeiter. He is the one who created the, uh, he came up with his own trinity, the trinity of evil. He, come, he, he created his own church. You can read that in Revelation. He has his own religious system. He will have his own religious leader. He will have his own false prophet. Whatever God does, Satan counterfeits it. And that's why the Bible teaches us we are to test every spirit lest we believe a deceiving lie of Satan. That's why if you don't build your life on the solid truth of God's Word, you, my friend, and I will be susceptible to the enemy taking and, and leading us astray from the things of God in this life. Pay attention. We live in a very deceptive society. And number seven, one other thing, it will always be idolatrous. As I said, the human heart is an idol factory, and the factory is always producing something for us to worship other than God. So you may want to worship your job, your beauty, your, your career, your pursuits. You worship your money. Worship anything. That's what the devil would say. Just don't worship God. Well, these are the marks of Babylon, and so today, there's no way I'm going to be able to go into detail based on all the information of these 24 verses that we have today, but what we will be able to do is I'll give you a, a, broad, a broad outline, all right? Dr. Lehman Strauss, he wrote a, a, a good outline. I was reading through all the different books, and I thought, well, this is the simplest one. I like it pretty good, so I'm going to give it to you, Okay. If you want to take notes, it's not, I'm not, I don't have this on the screen, but verses one through three, there is the announcement. Of judgment. God is bringing a judgment against the system and the world's um, uh, wealth centers. And so there's going to be the announcement of a mighty, a mighty angel. Uh, verse number four through eight. There is the appeal to the people of God, the people of God to be separate, the tribulational saints to be separate from this idolatrous, godless system, okay? And then 9 through 19, this is so interesting, 9 through 19, we see the agony of the people who lose everything. We see they're, they're, uh, they're very selfish, and they're not really in love with the great harlot or, uh, of Babylon, but what they are in love with is what she has produced by her deceptions and given them opportunities to amass amazing amounts of wealth, wealth beyond anything you and I could ever imagine, and when it's all uh, compiled together, it's phenomenal. And so they are in total agony based on the loss of this financial machine that worked for them for so long. And then 20 to 24, you will see the attitude of God's people. And you'll see the attitude of heaven itself, because whenever earth shouts something for the enemy as if you're right, I promise you heaven says, oh no, God is right. God is right. And even though we're going to see something very difficult, we have to understand that there's no malice in the heart of God. His love is pure, and God yet is going to bring wrath 
on the earth for its deception and its cruelty to humanity. And God is going to bring his vengeance against this earth. And that's what we're seeing in the climactic chapters of Revelation 17 and 18 and 19, how God is settling the score, all the accounting is done, and the Lord is paying them back for all their immoral deeds. And that's what we're about to read today. So, give you a little head start there. If you want to just write that down, the announcement of the mighty angel, the very appeal uh, of, of God to his people, the very agony of the people on earth when they see the moneymaker gone, and the attitude of heaven for righteousness and purity and holiness for the Lord God Almighty. Okay? So let's just, uh, now that you have that, I'll leave a little more room in case I want to write something else during the lesson. Let me just get rid of that. I hope you have it. If not, you can pause and write it down and we'll get going, okay? And I think I'm going to leave just enough silhouette that you can see it if you need to anyhow. How about that, okay? So let's Let's move on to the text now, Revelation 18.1, where we are actually looking at the, uh, the mighty angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. Again, we see so much in the book of Revelation about angelic authority and how God has commissioned them to carry out his plans and purposes on the earth. Now, I like this angel because it's fascinating to me. The Bible says the angel came to earth and it made bright. It was made, it made bright with his glory. See, this angel has been in the presence of God. The very glory of God is on this angel. And this angel is carrying out the purpose of God, Revelation 17, 17, and he is going to brighten the earth. See, that's something that is beyond our imagination, how one angel could light up the whole earth. And that's the power of a mighty angel with great authority. Revelation 18, 2. And he called out with a mighty voice. Again, if he's associated with God, he's a mighty individual. And so he's got a mighty voice. He's got a mighty countenance, a mighty brilliance. And he says this, fallen, fallen is Babylon. Now, when you think of Babylon, think of those seven characteristics that I taught you. Society without God. Everything's counterfeit, deceptive, violent. Think about those things, okay? And Babylon is fallen. Babylon the great. And that's the mentality of the world. Oh, this is great. This is so powerful. This is so wonderful. And she has become a dwelling place for demons. Now, I want you to think about the church of Jesus Christ is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. But the system that the world creates is the dwelling place for demons. And I want you to be careful, and I want you to understand that behind much of this world's power is demons. Demonic hordes from hell that are released, we see even a group of them in Revelation 9, that come up, they will torment the earth, but they empower the Antichrist. Satan empowers the Antichrist. They work together in strategies in order to bring down any semblance of God or godliness in our society or in our world or in all the nations of the world. They are a haunt, what a word, for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Babylon is corrupt, it's gross, and yet it's alive, it's, a, it's powerful in our world, and, and Babylon is marching in the major financial sectors of this world, okay? Now, I don't know. I, I, I hate to start calling names. I don't even need to call names. But you know and I know there are some major forces in our world through technology and through media. And I'm telling you behind so much of this amazing technology, this artificial intelligence, all of this trying to uh, traverse reality and to con distort reality and, and all the things that we're reading about now, I'll just go forward and say this, with the new metaverse and what they want to accomplish, 
Holy smokes, I am believing with all of my heart that behind it is demonic powers. And I don't, I don't know how to even, I don't even know how to deal with it in my, in my mind. But I have to believe this Babylon the Great, this world power, this world infusion of evil, it's demonic. And you better know it's demonic. And every unclean, detestable part of it is demonic because it is Satan originated. But God's purposes are going to come to pass, and God has a way of using what the enemy creates to bring about his own plans and purpose because God is greater. Verse number three, for all nations have drunk the wine of her passion. Think about this. Look at the imagery. The nations are drunk on the wine of sexual immorality, the passion of sexual immorality. All the kings of the earth have committed immorality. They've all gotten into bed with this particular Babylon, okay, or Babylonness. They're all in it together. Committed, they have committed immorality with her. And not only the kings of the earth, but the merchants of the earth. They've grown what? Rich from the power of her luxurious living. They're all filthy rich with her power. And I would just, I'm just looking at my notes, and I'm thinking about this whole Babylonian world system and how it's just a big drink of intoxication. Demonic, deceptive, counterfeit, artificial. It's everything you don't want to be a part of. And even though Revelation 18 is written to tribulational saints, I believe every one of us today living in the end times, at least the latter days of the last days, we have to pay attention because we know this system is entrenched, dug in, and passionate about getting converts. If the church was as passionate about converts to Christ as this system is to converting you away from Christ, we'd have a different kind of church today in our society. It, it does break my heart. The kings of the earth, the merchants of the earth, they've grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. How deceptive. Verse number four. Now we move to the second, and we hear the appeal coming for, forth to us to pay attention and to, and to hear God's people need to pay attention to something that God is saying. And I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying, be separate. He's saying, don't cave in. He's saying, don't collapse. Don't compromise with Babylon. Don't throw in your, your, your towel with her and walk with her. You'll be intoxicated by her, and the next thing you know, she's allured you away from God, and you're living as godless as the world system is godless. Revelation 18, 4, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her. What does that mean? Come out. Separate my people, lest you take part in her sins. That's what heaven has to say to us. And heaven has to say to those who are in the tribulation during that time, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't collapse to her confrontation, the conflict, the agony it will cause you. Don't give in. Even if you have to die, don't give in, lest you share in her plagues. And we know through the seals, the trumpets, the bowls, God is bringing these plagues upon the earth in order to repay man for his immoral stance against him and his people. God will set this system straight in the end. Revelation 18, 5, what? Her sins are heaped as high as the heavens. To me, that's an imagery of G Genesis chapter 11 when mankind said, let's build this tower of Babel all the way up to heaven. <laughs> God said, you didn't make it all the way with your tower, but you have made it all the way with your sins. And they sinned all the way up to heaven. And here's what you need to know. And God has remembered her iniquities. God has remembered her iniquities. 
I remember I wrote in my notes, I believe it's Jeremiah 31, 34, that God said there would be a day when he would remember our iniquities no more. And you and I would no longer be held accountable for the sins that we have committed. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all of our sins. But there, my friends, God makes it clear that he will remember her sins and they will give an account for all of their sins. Why? Because they refuse to allow Christ's sacrifice to be imputed into their lives or deposited into their lives. And so because of their refusal and rejection and rebellion against God, God said, I will remember your sins against you. Now, that ought to be terrifying because God is saying you're going to pay what you can't afford to pay for. You'll never be able to fulfill the payment of righteousness because of your filthy sins. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why it's imperative that we confess our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and be saved. What? Saved from the very wrath of God. Saved from the fact that God will no longer remember our sins, man. Come on. You want to get saved by the grace of God so that when you stand before him, he will look at you and see the righteousness of his son, and you will know that he will never remember your sins again. To God be the glory. Hey, there's not anybody in this room but me and you, but I'm going to shout glory because I have been forgiven of my sins by the grace and mercy of God. Revelation 18, 6 says, pay her back as she herself has paid back others. Man, when she brought evil against the prophets, evil against the prophets, the, the, the apostles, the people of God, think about all the martyrs, think about all the blood she said, God said, I'll pay you back for that. And she herself has paid back others and repay her, listen, double for her deeds. Mix a double portion. Boy, you talking about you talk about, you know, being intoxicated by Babylon. God said, mix a double. Make it stouter than you've ever had before. And, and that portion for her in the cup she mixed. So she has sown once, she's paying twice. God said, double it. We'll repay her twice. I can't even imagine what it's going to be like during the tribulation period. My friend, don't go through it. Don't go through it. Get saved by the grace of God. Revelation 18, 7. And this is her idolatry. This is her pride. This is her selfishness. And she glorified herself. Oh, no way they'll glorify God. This is a godless society. Remember Babylon. This, this financial system glorifies itself. This religious system glorifies itself. This political system glorifies itself. This Babylonish system is all about herself, itself. And they lived in luxury, and everything was wonderful. So give her a like measure of torment. You understand it's coming back, right? R.G. Lee used to preach payday someday. And this girl is about to get paid back, this Babylon. And, 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 and there will be torment and there will be mourning since in her heart she says, here's the pride and arrogancy of a Babylon-like system. I sit as a queen. I am no widow. And mourning I shall never see. I'm above mourning. I, I am too powerful to mourn. I am, I am all in all. And God said, I'm going to pay you back twice, and the measure is going to be full of torment and mourning. And even though you think you're, you're untouchable and that you're beyond God, the Babylonish, Babylonian system is not untouchable. It is not beyond the judgment of God. And so God is explaining to his people, do not be a part of this system. 
Do not get into the self-glorification. Do not be sold out on or, or drunk based on all of these luxuries that she somehow affords to you. Judgment's coming. For this reason, her plagues will come in a, listen, a single day. And I think later on, later on down in verse number, verse number 10, it says it will come not only in a single day, but her judgment will come in a single hour. It's like world collapsing in one hour. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine. And she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. As powerful as this world's system has become, as great and enormous and wealthy and luxurious as it may be, the Lord God is greater and he will judge her. You may not side with the Lord now, but the day will come you will wish to God you had. We go to verse number 9, and 9 through 19 is so interesting because it gives so many details into this system. And I want you to pay attention to it because it is, it is, um, it's an agony. It's the agony of defeat. And they don't know, the world just doesn't know how to handle it. Because they don't, know, they don't know God. Man is not equipped to handle things bigger than himself if he's not equipped to know God who is bigger than he is. And so the kings of the earth, those we read about earlier in the chapter, they've committed sexual immorality. They've lived in luxury with her. Think about the rich and the famous, the powerful. Now, there are some rich and famous people that I know have faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope they are good stewards with their resources and fund, fund the, the kingdom of God, advance the mission of God. There were many wealthy people in Scripture that were born again, but I'll promise you, that there are a multitude of people who are wealthy and famous, and they're, but they're immoral, they're ungodly, they're, they're unholy, and, and their whole life is to glorify themselves. And that's the judgment. It's coming on them. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, they will weep. I mean, the, joy, the, the fun's over. That season ends. And they will weep and they will wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. When the most powerful people, probably in the penthouses of New York and, and all of these great cities around the world, they will be looking down and they will see within one hour the collapse of the entire financial world system. And they will weep and they will wail and they will mourn. I mean, you only have to go back and look at the images of people jumping out of buildings after the stock market crashed in, what, 1929? The devastation of people, the depression of people, which put a whole country in depression, by the way. And that was just one little, that was just one little market of one little section of, of the world. And people are losing their minds. Well, the economy today has been so globalized when the whole global economy crashes, you can only imagine the weeping and the wailing. And I want you to know the Bible makes it clear. That system, when he, when he brings this judgment on, in, in Revelation 18, that system will be no more. There are six no mores in the Scripture in Revelation 18. We'll read them together in a moment. And God is going to make it clear. There will be no more. There will be no coming back after this collapse. The kings of the earth weep, they wail, they see the smoke of her burning, they see the collapse of the whole system. They're going to stand far off in fear of her torment, and they're going to say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon. And that's where we have to believe in this resurrected Babylonian city, maybe south of Baghdad where Saddam Hussein began his own restoration, thinking that he was the incarnate of this great world power and this great world leader. 
this city will collapse. This system will fall. For in a single hour, your judgment has come. Think about it. One day, one hour, it's over. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her, not because they loved her, but because they got rich off her. They used her. And since no one buys their cargo anymore, no cargo of gold, no cargo of silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, it's, no one's buying, it's done. They're out of business. Cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and look, this is the one that gets me. Slaves, that is, human souls. Think about the trafficking, the sex trafficking, the slavery, the bondage. Even in the 21st century, that still exists. Satan still enslaving people. And God said, all of a sudden, y'all have made money off all this for so long. And now, it's done. The fruit of which, for which your soul longed has gone from you. And all your delicacies and all your splendors are lost to you. Never to be, watch, found again. I'm telling you, for the tribulational people who die in rebellion to God, in love with a system that deceived you, that deceived them, there's no coming back. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, they will say, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet. You can see that in Revelation 17. Adorned with gold and with jewels and with pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off. When I just think for a moment about the shipmasters and the trade on the sea, what have you seen in the news in the last, let's say, a month? Have you not seen the ships backed up in the ports? Have you not seen the breakdown in the delivery systems in America, even around the world? Have you not seen those ships on the sea? It's interesting, you and I probably haven't seen a lot of that lately in our lifetime, but all of a sudden we're seeing how shipmasters and seafaring sailors make a living on the sea, and if they can't get their wares to the port, they're all complaining about the supply lines breaking down and we can't get food to the people. What's happening? Hey, if we're seeing it today, maybe God is bringing to our mind some imagery that is not too far around the next corner just a thought. Revelation 18, 18, and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? You can see that they made this city their God. There's questions in the scripture that says, who is like our God? Who is like Jehovah? There is no God like our God, and yet these people believe that the great city and the system of Babylon itself was the great God in their heart, and that God will let them down because that is a false God. Revelation 18, 19, and they drew dust on their heads. They just uh, threw this dust on their heads as they wept and they mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. And I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, when, when the moneymaker is shut down, the world collapses. Because they're in love with the system. They're in love. 
we look at the latter part of this book. And I want you to see this because I don't think this is callous. But I think this is a righteous shout from heaven over the fall of evil on earth. It's like, finally, the evil that began all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, and then we read in Genesis chapter 4 that implemented its first action in murder of one brother against another. And since that time, there have been multitudes of murders and the slaughter of innocents, and there has been the brutal persecution of God's people on earth. There has been the bloodshed of prophets, the bloodshed of the apostles, the bloodshed of the church, the bloodshed of preachers, the bloodshed of missionaries. And finally, the evil that instituted it all has been shut down on earth. And the Bible says, rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints and the apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. God said, I have settled the score. They accumulated their sins for long enough, and now God said, I'm calling it, uh, I'm calling it in. And, and now everybody's going to give an account, and God brings his, his judgment. And I'm telling you, heaven rejoices. But I don't think there's any malice in their heart. No one's rejoicing that multitudes have passed. Heaven is rejoicing that evil is over. At least for this part. And when we read in Revelation chapter 19 and 20, God will eradicate all evil for all eternity. There's still a lot to learn based off what I just said in the next couple of weeks. Because we're going to go into a period when Christ will come back and set up his throne on earth and there will be a thousand year millennial reign of Jesus on the earth where there will be uh, perfect peace. And yet there are some things that will happen during that millennium that has to be settled toward the end of that millennium. And it's interesting and you'll want to learn that. But eventually there will be no more weeping, no more sin, no more evil, for God will have eradicated it all forever and ever and ever. We'll read about that in Revelation 20 and 21. And then we'll enjoy 22, glory, hallelujah, for eternity. But the judgment has come against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found, what? No more. No more. And the sound of the harpist and the musicians uh, and the flute players and the trumpeters will be heard in that city, what? No more. There's no more music to soothe them. There's no more music to distract them. There's no more of this world's music to, to take their minds off the things of God. There's no more. There will be no more craftsmen or any, any craft that will be found in, in, in her. No more. No more building. No more. The sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. There's no grinding of the corn. There's no making of meal. That'll be no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. You want to know what's going to be in Babylon when it's all said and done? Darkness. Total outer darkness. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. All the festival times of huge weddings and all of these just amazing, luxurious parties, no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. It's demonic. Revelation 18, 24, and we are done for today. And in her was found the blood of prophets, for think about how many people have died because of the Babylon likeness. 
and the blood of saints, which we read about in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, in the sixth seal, and they cried out unto the altar, the blood of the martyrs, how long, O oh God? And God now has answered their question. And all who have been slain on earth. So at this time, the religious system of the Antichrist has collapsed. The lies, the deception, the sorcery, the de de demonic powers, Satan himself, they couldn't stop it. For God is greater. The financial system is collapsed. The political system has collapsed. All the kings of the nation are mourning. They are weeping. All the merchants, they're mourning, they're weeping. And so what we have left is a people that will amass together. The masses will come together and they will all march on this city called Jerusalem. And we will see in Revelation 19, Jesus will come back and deal the final blow to the armies of this earth that are fighting against him. Revelation 19. You don't want to miss it. God be with you till we meet again.